what we should do is we should recognize that there are different modalities. There are different ways in which human beings process information. And that different means of processing, and now I am giving away more, that different means of processing will, will, will change the ways in which we function. It's not that one functioning is the best functioning and one func functioning is worse. It's that the functional change is an indication of the distinctions in content organization. Right? So, I mean, that's, I think that's a better approach. It's off the top. I, I think you having the time to watch the, the, the video, to read the book, to think about it reflectively, reflectively and compare secondary and um, primary sources can probably come up with something even more complex. But the idea is, one, to make sure you understand. I think you do now. You should. If you've understood what I've said, it should be crystal clear. But two, now that you understand, I think we can take it a step further, and now I can give you the impetus that you might need to, to do some good in the world and to make sure that members of this community aren't demonized by epistemology. And what I think is a very perverse view, uh, it's a very canonical view, but it's a very privileged, perverse view, where privilege is in proper perceptive functionality. And I think a contemporary epistemologist can do a better job. They need to do a better job. Okay, so bullet point number three, question. Since it has been demonstrated that in using our senses, we are prone to misinterpretation, well, yeah, misperception, and since that fact compromises the reliability of some aspects of our knowledge, does it compromise the, the totality of all of our knowledge? And the answer is obviously no, it doesn't. It might undermine some aspects of our knowledge when I think that everybody loves me because I'm drunk. <laughs> When I think that I love everybody because I'm trying, hey man, I love you, man, I love you, man, I love you. <laughs> and then I sober up and I recognize that I don't stand, I can't stand these people and they, can, they can't stand me either. Well, I reassess my knowledge. But does that collapse my ability to drive a car, my belief that I love my daughter, my, my ability to, you know, be a fallout? No, it doesn't. It, it, all of my knowledge doesn't collapse because that individual belief collapse, collapses. No, not at all. And the justification? Explain existential instantiation and universal generalization related to epistemological reliability. Holy crap, Jason. Um, the, the short version, right? You can go, I'm going to be super short in this. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this at all because I, you know, it takes me off tangent a little bit and the vibe changes a bit. The idea is you can go from all to some, right? If all is the case, then you can go from all to some. But you can't go from some to all. Right? You can't say that here's an individual belief and thus the collapse of this individual belief collapses all of the beliefs. But if the collapse of all of the beliefs occurs, then obviously any individual belief occurs. Right? So that's the extent of that. Don't want to overkill it. For those of you that understand the terminology, you have a deeper understanding of it. But you know, I think what would be cool in the lecture series is to present it in this way. And if somebody is obscene enough to watch this a second time later, many years later, you know, it'd be cool. My, like, my dream is, quick tangent, he's only got one bullet point left and then I'm done with section 1.2, but it'd be cool to have, like, a, a very novice young student watch the epistemolo epistemology lecture series all the way through. I don't know how many hours this is going to be because I'm in the process of doing it now. They watch this, the series all the way through. They graduate undergrad. They graduate masters. They graduate PhD. They become a professional epistemologist. They go back many years later, assuming that the world doesn't end on the 21st of December this year, they go back later and watch the series again, and they get a deeper level of understanding. Because the things that, they, that I suggested in their first viewing, they didn't understand. But when they have a more complex, nuanced understanding of epistemology, they pick up. I think it would just be cool, right? Um, so here's to the next generation of epistemologists. I want you to be fair and think critically. Um, last bit, quote, last bullet point, quote, so the fact that we are sometimes wrong are deceived. This is super important. Shout out to Stroud, dude. He, uh, you know, just like class act epistemologist, right? So the fact that we are sometimes wrong or deceived in our judgments based on the senses isn't enough in itself to show that the senses are never to be trusted and are therefore never reliable as a source of knowledge. I mean, that's just such a great point. It's just, a, for me, I love stuff like that, right? And what, what Barry Shroud is saying is simple. It's like, okay, the Cartesian methodological skepticism, skeptical process is, is legitimate, conceptually speaking. 
But don't throw out all the senses. Don't just say that, you know, our senses aren't good, they're not for any purpose, because it's going to be, you're going to be really hard-pressed to find any content knowledge that is itself not derived in some respect to the senses. And Descartes himself arguably failed in this because where he thought he was, you know, I think therefore I am the cogito, he thought he had arrived at something which he could say he knew with absolute certainty. Well, I mean, he find, we find out later uh, that the language that he uses is not his own. It was French. Uh, and that's not something of his own creation. And that is acquired, the structure and the linguistic relationship between nouns and verbs and adjectives and blah, 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 all come from a community of speakers, and thus, you're not there by yourself, Descartes. <laughs> you haven't escaped the senses, right? The senses have informed your cogito, thus your whole system collapses, unfortunately. At least one critique of Descartes is, right? So that the idea, the idea is not to get rid of the senses, right? The demonization that the senses are, are bad and lead to bad things, epistemologically speaking, in terms of uncertainty or lack of certainty or lack of precision, is completely, is completely false. And I love how Schaub said it. It's, it's, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, is what he's saying, basically. What I want to do is I want to take it a step further than Schaub, but building on that concept, is to say that don't, make the epistemological assumption then that since we're talking about the reliability of the perceiver and the perceiver's content knowledge in terms of human functionality in the world, we have to take another contemporary look at this epistemological notion of reliability. Because it seems to lend itself to misinterpretation of perception perceiver having been misled, misinformed, false categorization, right? It, it has this very sort of pejorative sense where your functionality and your inability to act and to conduct your body and to hold your body in a particular manner in the world is now normatively worse, like you're failing in some sense. And, it's, and it's, all of this justification is rooted in epistemology. My contribution to the world is to say, I really understand this discipline, obviously, and I want you to think about the assumptions, because one implication of such an assumption is that if you function in the world improperly, it's because you have a failure in your ability to cognitively process the facts. I would like to hear an antithetical account from an epistemological community to inform the neuroscientists and the cognitive scientists to say that it's not about better or worse. It's that we recognize how the individual, autistic individual, for example, and there are many other examples, but I think specifically with respect to autism, how the autistic individual um, categorizes and organizes data isn't a failure in the reliability between what they believe and how they act, Right? So that we need to really challenge this notion of reliability. Right? It's just that they function different. It's not better or worse. They're not less reliable because you stumble or you're less reliable in your knowledge because you don't talk to people or you look away from people. Right? That's, that's, to say that the content knowledge is less reliable because I can't, I can't assess how you function in the world properly, I mean, I think that's, that's getting a little antiquated now. And I think we need to sort of revise our understanding of that. But I'm not going to get into the, the bits because I'm not necessarily interested in that research at all. I think it's valuable research, but I'm not interested in doing it. I'd be interested in reading it, but I'm not going to take the time to sort of compile that myself. Um, you know, I just want to see epistemology. You know, I, I give away freaking iPads for philosophy. When I say long live philosophy, I, like, I really mean it. Uh, and part of long living philosophy is me throwing out ideas for other people to do the research so that philosophy retains its relevance. If philosophy is still talking about Cartesian misperception and the discussion ends there, um, what a tragedy for the discipline because we're antiquated and we have no relevance in the world. If philosophers recognize that we can begin with sort of Descartes' methodological skepticism, transition to Stroud's um, contemporary discourse on 
sort of notions of reliability and content knowledge, and then end with an application of all of that in terms of reassessing content knowledge based on an analysis of epistemological functioning of autistic people, then, wow, you know, my lecture series is, has, has made philosophy viable again. Not that it's just me, it's a lot of us doing it, but, you know, this is my bit, so this is what I do. So, I think uh, that should be clear. So, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.